Hey, listeners, happy 2023. This is Watto here, and I just wanted to let you know that this year we're going to be slightly tweaking our format. What does that mean? It means based on listener feedback for, I guess, many years now, we are going to be moving our upfront period where we get to know the guests, we get book recommendations, we talk about picks of the week. We're going to move that to the end of the show after the guest gives their take-home points about the topic that we learned about that day. Let us know how you like this new format, but we're going to try it out for a while now so you can get right to the learning as soon as the show starts. Thank you and enjoy the show. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know if we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. On tonight's show, we're talking about ADHD, a topic that I really needed to learn more about with a great guest, Dr. Kevin Simon. We'll tell you all about him in a second. But first, Paul, how are you doing? And uh, why don't you tell people what is it that we do on The Curbsiders? I, Matt, I, I'm good. Thank you for asking. I probably shouldn't tell you this. I, I kind of clock what degree of friend I am every time that you mention it. And I've had a good, it's been a pretty good run of great friend, which I, it makes me feel nice. I almost don't want to jinx it, but I just, I just want to let you know publicly in front of our, our audience that it's, it just, it feels good. So thank you for that. Um, but to get to your question, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Tonight, as you mentioned, we talked to the great Dr. Kevin Simon about ADHD. So in terms of when to consider the diagnosis, specifically in adults, because we are adult doctors taking care of adults. Um, We talked about medication management, sort of how to mitigate um, the concerns for diversion, some of the the practical ways to to sort of choose which agent to start with and what that should look like. So just a lot of really high quality stuff that I feel like I just I didn't get a whole ton of in my training. So I'm glad to have kind of the chance to circle back and learn more about it because it it seems to come up a fair amount. Um, So uh, we had this conversation with our guest, Dr. Kevin Simon, Dr. Simon. Uh, is the inaugural Chief Behavioral Health Officer for the City of Boston, and he serves as an attending psychiatrist at Boston Children's Hospital. He's also an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, a Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Health Policy at Harvard University, and the Medical Director of Wayside Youth and Family Support Network. Clinically, he practices as a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist, caring for youth, young adults, and families through the Adolescent Substance Use and Addiction Program at Boston Children's Hospital. As if that's not enough, he (laughs) works as a researcher uh, where he's received federal funding for work focused on the intersections of mental health, substance use, and justice. He completed clinical fellowships in child and adolescent psychiatry and addiction medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and an adult psychiatry residency at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, Feeling just less and less qualified to do anything, Matt. Um, Dr. Simon received his MD from the SIU School of Medicine after attending Morgan State University for college. Dr. Simon's writings on mental health, substance use, systems of care, and healthcare equity are published in leading journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the American Journal of Public Health, and Health Affairs. Uh, So without further ado, and maybe even without a pun, why don't we get to it? And a reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And with that, let's get to the show. Kevin, thank you so much for agreeing to join us Join us on the show. And I know we have limited time, so I think we should get into the cases here. 100%. We are, we are jam-packed. So let's, let's start with Ms. Alice Jones. She is a 23-year-old woman. She's coming to our office for the establishment of care with a new primary care physician and comes to us really with not much in the way of past medical history. She is currently attending college. She's majoring in finance. She lives with a roommate but feels safe in her home. She does drink alcohol on the weekends, sometimes more than she intends to, but she's not too worried about that because she figures that's just sort of the life of a college student. She also vapes mostly when she's drinking uh, and denies other substance use. You're about to, you know, so she comes in, you feel good about the visit. You're about to pat her on the head, maybe give her a lipid panel um, and some general counseling. <laughs> when she shares that she thinks that she may have ADHD, she says that she saw a TikTok video and she's kind of embarrassed to admit this, but she says it went through the symptoms of ADHD and they actually, a lot of them lined up with some of the things that she was feeling. And she actually, since you did such a good job of establishing a therapeutic relationship with her shares that she even tried a friend's Adderall a few times when she was studying and she really found it helpful to kind of help with her focus. Um, So before we get into whether or not we should actually treat the patient or continue her, um, her self-prescribed medications, we should probably talk about the diagnosis itself, which is as we were talking before we got started, I never felt like I had a great grasp on at least during my training. So could you at least talk us through 
Kevin, sort of what exactly ADHD is and sort of how we should start thinking about it. Yeah. Um, so one, um, definitely resonate with the provider who's having to see her. Um, so ADHD or um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a condition um, of essentially executive functioning. And so the way to think about it is there's three types. Um, so there's the inattentive type. There's a category of symptoms. There's nine of them. Um, not sure if you want me to walk through all nine, but um, a youth where ADHD is classically um, identified would have to kind of meet six of nine criteria, um, whereas an adult would actually just have to meet five of nine of the criteria. So again, with regards to inattention, think about um, failing to pay attention to close details, um, having difficulty actually sustaining attention. Um, and when we say sustaining attention, sustaining attention for the mundane task, right? Um, it's fine to watch TikTok or Instagram or, or video game because that's actually very stimulating. Um, but trying to do, say, read five pages of a textbook or a newspaper, um, that's where the inattention is actually going to show up most. Um, struggling to kind of follow through with directions from, you know, A to C. Um, do you find that, you know, around B you're, you're getting lost? Um, and then appearing not to pay attention. Uh, so, the, you know, this classically is other people seemingly have to say, Paul, Paul, Paul. Um, and you're just almost oblivious because, again, that intention, you're, you're very distracted to other things. Um, and then, again, with this idea of struggling to uh, get through the mundane, things that require, that you know require cognitive um, stamina, you generally try to avoid. Um, so there are some other symptoms that are easily distracted, but uh, for an adult in the inattentive realm, they'd have to have five of those you know, criteria. And this is over several months. Um, and then the hyperactive, which is classically associated, um, again, thinking about youth, the kiddo that's kind of like the uh, Tasmanian devil, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, just kind of like bouncing all over the place. Um, that actually tends to most often subside as one becomes an adult, but in the event of just being thorough here, um, fidgety, restless. Um, so obviously you got to figure out that restlessness because of the energy or restlessness because of an anxiousness. Um, definitely like being still, um, which itself, again, is a cognitive task. Um, kind of feeling like as though you're driven by this motor. So again, easily identifiable in use, less identifiable in adults, but you might hear of people who struggle to seemingly do one thing. And so what they're describing is this idea of having multiple jobs. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's this idea of you're really not comfortable just doing one. And so this is the person that, oh, Monday to Thursday, Monday to Tuesday, they did one thing. Uh, Wednesday, they have another gig. On the weekends, they have another gig, yet they seemingly don't ever rest. So it's like, wait a minute, why? Like, I'm not hearing about like calming down. Um, and then, uh, often this is the person that's interrupting. So again, can't be patient um, in terms of just listening. Um, although yes, most physicians don't really aren't, aren't patient. Um, <laughs> patient. Um, this would be in the context of again, family dinner um, at the office space. And, and so again, for adults, we'd have to have five of the nine. Um, so there's an inattention, there's a hyperactive, and then there's a combined type assuming that you meet five and five of both criteria. Um, so, th so that's generally what ADHD is. Now, it's a little challenging here because if an adult, they could just look it up and say, oh, well, yes, I have these things. Um, but, but in our um, uh, test patient here, right, 23 years old, you can kind of do that history and say, okay, well, how did you do in school? Um, be that college, they, if they pursued college, um, definitely high school, because they were going to have to complete high school. Um, so you can get at kind of understanding, is a person really struggling with attention or inattention, executive functioning, kind of by asking the social dynamic questions, right? Tell me about your employment, tell me about your relationships. Um, so sometimes you're trying to get at the core symptoms by asking um, you know, ancillary questions that, that kind of hint at it. And I'm just pausing here because I'm talking 
for a very long time. And I like to listen when I want to talk. Fantastic. No, and I, I don't know if Matt was doing the same thing. I'm like cataloging symptoms. I'm like, I'm, okay, do I meet five of nine for that? And I, I don't know. I, I feel like we're not going to self-diagnose on the show. But Paul, I think I know you. You're very high functioning. I think that's the part that, you know, the last part he was talking about. I was thinking like, you know, do I bet a lot of people check some of these boxes, but then you're like, nope, got straight A's. Their relationships are great and they're they're high functioning. Yeah, I, I know you, Paul. I, mean, I minus, think but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I rate you high, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what you're bringing up actually is very, very interesting in so much as um, at the uh, academic graduate level, um, there are a number of people who end up recognizing that they have ADHD in so much as it is about the normative experience, right? And so if your classmates are able to sit, attend to the class, yet Somehow you're the one who's not able to, and not because of the materials being difficult, but literally just actually just can't sit still um, and you can't just be in the library for an extended period of time. It it, it comes up. And so um, there are settings where I recognize that um, law students, graduate students of different sorts, um, when there's a high demand and the normative experience of, of the, the class is that they're meeting the demand and then someone's kind of not, but again, not due to the intellectual challenge of the material, but just like there's a lot of material to, to learn and to study and to organize. Um, sometimes you recognize that um, the ADHD, because you've been compensating because you can, you know, pay attention to many different things. So at certain um, academic levels, you can accommodate, but then at other levels, it actually becomes very difficult, you know, carrying 10 patients mm. and you're like, wait a minute, where do I start? Like, how do I just even organize myself? Um, so, so there are times um, in the in an adult population, um, it, it can present itself because the demand is is that high. But I just this is the point that I really need clarity on it. It sounds, though, like the symptoms are sort of declaring themselves in adulthood, but are probably still present, I guess, so my, my bigger question is, does this have to be a childhood diagnosis or can you develop ADHD de novo sort of as an adult? More often than not, there likely were symptoms as a child. Um, did you recognize it? Or really did the parent recognize it, right? Because some parents may say, oh, you know what? Hey, Paul's just an energetic boy. Um, you live in the Midwest, go, go out into the cornfields and, and that's completely fine, right? <laughs> um, and... Or are you um, the youth that really can't sit still in class and you're being uh, disruptive to the entire rest of the class? And so um, this does delve into the kind of like disparities that we see in terms of the diagnosis itself. Um, but it can actually, I guess, in, in theory, be dormant or hiding just for the sake that somebody hasn't alerted a pediatrician or a primary care doc at the younger age. I wonder if that just the the fact that it's not recognized and and that's why it's been so hard to figure out if there really is a late onset or not is because you just you it's clear that there is the diagnosis in an adult person but you just don't have enough history to prove that that, that existed when they were a child. I wonder if that's why they're questioning. Right. And and you know for for kids um it, it's not even a matter of just oh you you have six of those nine criteria. The question is does it exist in multiple domains, right? So this is where um, in, in the child world, we'll get the Vanderbilt. Um, that's where the teacher fills it out, the parent fills it out. And then yes, there's the clinical uh, interaction that I'm having with the youth or, or providers having with the youth. Um, but where the reality is ADZ doesn't turn off. And so it should show up when they're um, on a team. It should show up uh, when they're in the grocery store, it should show up. Right? So it should show up in multiple places. And so this is where if you're only hearing about dysregulation or dysfunction in one domain, then you have to start thinking, wait, mm, is this something else? Um, but when there's schools an issue, homes an issue, with peers is it, there's an issue, then you, you can start to say, okay, wait a minute, they, they're, this might be uh, truly evident. So the same thing would be for adults too, right? It, it, it can't only be um, at the job, it, there has to be something that's showing up um, at home. So are you paying your bills on time? Why, why aren't things on auto pay? Um, why, why are you forgetting um, certain tasks? Um, so 
the the screeners that we have often are are asking about things across domains. And I, I do want to get to the the screening instruments in, in just a minute. But I before we even get there, if someone is bringing in a, a history that has some symptoms consistent with ADHD, and I and I imagine again with with adults, it's going to be more the the attention deficit than the hyperactivity part. Are there any other comorbid illnesses that we should be concerned about, things that we should be aggressive in ruling out before we start to truly consider the diagnosis of ADHD um, in, in a new patient for us? Yeah, so um, core one, well, big ones. So anxiety is just the most common mental health condition. So obviously we want to rule out anxiety because that itself could kind of manifest or hide as other things, right? But, well, why aren't you being more social? Um, why aren't you initiating a task, right? So sometimes I, I kind of frame it as like a... Um, um, work inertia, like you, you know you have something to do, but it's, you're just so anxious at the idea of, of wanting to pursue it that you just don't. Um, so anxiety is one. Depression, um, obviously a major one in terms of you you will be inattentive, um, not particularly motivated um, if you have a if if you have a classic form of depression. Um, obviously, you should be thinking about substance use disorders, um, sleep. Right? Are you getting an adequate amount of sleep? Um, because it's going to be particularly hard if you're not getting, um, and, and I'll be gracious here, six minimum hours of sleep that are restful and you wake up and you're, and you're wondering how come you can't get certain things. And the question is, well, if your sleep baseline is, is poor, well, we, we need to you know, figure that first. Um, so I, I do try to ask just you know, whole health questions um, before assuming that um, it's, it's definitively ADHD, again, dietary habits, um, right? Because what you eat clearly going to impact your level of cognition. Um, so, so there are things to ensure you're asking about. Um, but if all those things in theory are, are ruled out or, or seen as, as, as normative and the person's still describing, um, then that's where you could inquire about behavioral things that you could do, right? Okay, do you have a calendar? Do you have a checklist, right? There are things that you could put in place to help yourself um, if you've gotten to 23, 33, and, and you've been generally functional. Um, but if you're doing those things and still struggling, then okay, maybe there's there's some more that we, we need to inquire about. Great. So that that's extraordinarily helpful. So let's let's say we we've done our due diligence. We don't think anxiety. We don't think depression. They have tried some compensatory tactics that have not been helpful. We, we don't think acute caffeine withdrawal. Um, because God bless. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, they would have my unending sympathy. So I, I guess my my question is is sort of do you have like what initial screening tools do you have? And then if, if they would sort of if they would screen positive, then where do you go from there? So how what's your your overall approach for someone where you suspect ADHD? Um. This is where I'll say screeners are challenging in so much as in this person's case, right? They watched on, on TikTok and said, hey, uh, these are the symptoms. So if I say, well, how often have problems remembering appointments or obligations occurred for you? You know, the person potentially may say, oh, well, more often than not um, for all of the questions. Um, so. Uh, there are screeners, but again, be, if you have an adult um, who, who is competent, um, you'll have to do more than just ask the screening questions because the screening questions could lend themselves to the person saying, oh, yes, oftentimes, Doc. Um, so so screeners are helpful, but you, you really do have to do a due diligence of thinking about the, the again, multiple domains of their life. I was reading one of the articles was was talking about just like neuropsych testing, especially for patients that are maybe older. You know, sometimes I get 40, 50, 60 year old patients telling me they think they have ADHD and, oh, you know, they didn't really diagnose it when I was a kid. I think I would have been diagnosed. And yeah, um, I, I'm not sure if you if you think that would be useful. Um, I'll answer from uh, full chronological ages here. So neuropsychological testing can be potentially helpful for ADHD or any neurodevelopmental condition. Um, and neuropsych testing will test multiple domains, executive functioning, learning and memory, reading, could be mathematics, problem solving. Um, the mm -hmm. challenge here is one, ADHD is a clinical diagnosis, so it's not required that you have a neuropsychological test. But then also the um, accessibility of neuropsych tests 
is problematic. Um, you know, on the on the yes. youth end, for like a, a major academic centers, we're talking about more than 12, 18 months. So, you know, that's prohibitive. And then on the adult side, um, the same wait list exists. And then insurance does not generally cover this. Now, yeah. the time where insurance may is if you have an individual that has a neurodevelopmental condition like autism, um, and but there's some statutes that are associated with autism that imply why that would be covered. But under the normal circumstance, like, like the patient we're talking about, um, that person, depending on, on what city we're in, um, could pay a thousand up to five thousand dollars for a neuropsych test that may not really tell anything different than uh, what Mad Paul or I can can do in 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 meeting with them. I did not know that. I I haven't had any angry patients come back to me say they. Uh, I haven't sent many patients for this purpose. Mostly, I'm sending to neuropsych if I think someone has might have dementia. Right. And and that hasn't I haven't had any reimbursement issues there, but I haven't tried sending anyone for ADHD. So this is what I was going to say is is if you have the you know early onset dementia, um, right? And and so potentially either you you all are, are sending the referral or you, you go to neuro, right? Like the indication is different, um, and so yeah. the coverage for that um, is likely is likely present. Um, but but okay. you say thirty four year old. Um, you know, curious about ADHD and there's no history of it and, and you just want it to get covered, there's a good chance that uh, you need a prior off, good chance that prior off would be denied. Um, but if, again, the, the dementia case that likely would be covered, um, autism or someone who has already a diagnosed intellectual disability, that could be covered. Uh, traumatic brain injury, that could be covered. Um, but just run of the mill, um, I'm at my annual visit and, and I bring up ADHD, um, potentially not. To Paul, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah, no, me too. I will say it's funny. One of one of my colleagues, um, who I, I won't embarrass by name, is, is someone who really did a deep dive on ADHD because they were just so tired of feeling bad at it and sort of waiting for the referrals and worrying about costs and talking about some of the things. So it has, um, they actually, she did the deep dive and is now she was the person actually introduced me to one of the structured interview tools. So I think she uses the Diva 2.0, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I guess what I'm where I'm going with this is I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking us through is there about what tools are available, say, in the primary care setting where we could maybe do some of the work ourselves? Like, how, how would you recommend the average internist who is maybe relatively new to, to treating and managing ADHD is or what, what tools exist to help them kind of navigate whether or not this is truly the diagnosis or not? Yeah, so you can utilize structured interviews. Um, what I would um, be cautious about, but, and I suspect your colleagues would be cautious about, is the time uh, afforded to them in, in their space, um, right? Mm -hmm. So structured interviews, um, so not structured screeners, but structured interviews oftentimes are more than 20 minutes. Um, yeah. And so now if you, if you become proficient at it, then yes, you can uh, kind of move to it quickly. Um, but it, you know, if something takes 40 minutes to do, um, I don't know how well that fits in the context of a traditional um, uh, outpatient clinic. Um, but in terms of um, you can have a checklist um, that, that is inquiring of the core symptoms. That's great. That's really and that's exactly where I was hoping to go. I think we we're heading towards let's let's say, Ms. Jones, we decide we, we go through a structured interview. We actually we have administration that gives us 45 minutes to go through a, a structured interview in the office. and We devote a setting a, a visit just to that. And it seems like she probably had some childhood symptoms or symptoms are consistent with ADHD. We want to treat, I guess, before we before we drill down into the treatment, which I, I think you actually gave us a great start on. I did want to ask if you had a sense of how concordant sort of self-reported symptoms are with the diagnostic tools, like how often do those things line up? And I don't know if you're, if you can sort of answer that with, with a specific number or not, but at least in your experience, if someone sort of self-diagnoses themselves, the HG, how often is that consistent with what's, what you're finding in the office or um, even just in your experience? So um, don't have great data on this. However, just from uh, clinical experience and, and being very mindful uh, the majority of my clinical experience is in a dual diagnosis uh, uh, setting. Um, so when I was in more of a uh, generalist psychiatry setting, 
I would say that th there was a good percentage of patients who might hint at um, maybe they're, they're not actually bringing it up, but I'm then doing a review and, and I'm doing a screener um, that hint at elements of ADHD. And there is a subset of patients who actually don't want it, <laughs> don't want the diagnosis, uh, don't want to be on on stimulants, don't like the fact that they're talking to a psychiatrist. Um, and then those patients that get initiated on it um, and find the benefit, um, I, I'd say that is the majority of the patients that when you find that, you know, there's actually an issue and again, you, you're thoughtful about initiating the medication and alert them to what the potential side effects, most will find the benefit. I wanted to ask about the, because you mentioned the long acting uh, stimulant medication seem to be where the evidence is now. And I was, I was trying to get wrap my head around this because uh, I just, I just really don't have a lot of experience treating ADHD. Uh, I have some med patients that were on them when I met them and I'm just continuing them, but I, I haven't really made the initial choice so that I'm hoping to get some insight into that. So I understand there's some non-stimulant medications that can be used for ADHD, but the, the stimulant medications. So what are the you know, how many are of the stimulants are there that we should think about? And I, I know there's like short, intermediate, long acting. Uh, the way that I, I explain it to, to patients, um, medications that are FDA indicated for ADSD, we broadly have three buckets. Um, within the stimulants, there's two, amphetamine based and methylphenidate based. And then there's non stimulants, of which there are several medications. Um, in terms of the kind of first line, um, methylphenidates, they again tend to be the strongest, uh, they tend to be the softest, um, and the kind of grandfather of methylphenidates, the one that most people will have heard of or know, is Ritalin. Um, now that's mm. not the first um, methylphenidate extended release long acting that I choose, but just in terms of like name recognition for patients, um, Ritalin. And then uh, when we talk about amphetamines, um, again, mixed salt amphetamine, um, the name recognition that um, patients will, will often um, think about is Adderall. So just to orient mm -hmm. patients to the different types, um, that's, that's what I initially will say. In terms of methylphenidates, and this is also true for amphetamines, there are extended release, i.e. long acting, and then there are short acting. Um, within methylphenidates, in the long-acting realm, there's what we call pro-drug. Um, and so the, um, the pro-drug in the methylphenidate um, is dexmethylphenidate, um, which, which has a, a brand to it. Um, but generally, you can start with just methylphenidate extended release. Now... The challenge here is that the, and sometimes actually insurance, unfortunately, will kind of dictate to you which one you're going to choose um, because, mm -hmm. um, so for instance, in uh, Massachusetts, um, within the, the panel of medical family, they said that you can, you can try. So patients that are on, on Mass Health or Medicaid, um, they have their, kind of four that they want to see you try. And so I would suspect that um, in our listeners' respective states, um, if they actually just go to their Medicaid um, formulary list, there's likely um, a subset of the stimulants that you actually would need to try um, before going to one of the newer ones that um, people might hear about that they can take at night and has a special release formulation that doesn't release until the morning. Well, I want to try to summarize a little bit of this. So we we talked about there's methylphenidate, there's methylphenidate, and then there's the amphetamines, um, and there's a bunch of different flavors of those in general. Yes. And we're going to be somewhat a uh, slave to the formulary that we're dealing with. So we 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 will kind of get used to those. Yep. And the long acting formulations are what you would recommend if if we are able to at least to start and we're going to kind of start low, go slow, yes. check for side effects and adjust 
Yes. Um, it, that seems to be the gist so far. And uh, another nuance here. In terms of the short acting, so most long acting are capsule um, uh, forms or tablet forms. Um, most of the short acting are tablet, i.e. crushable. Um, so mm -hmm. just in terms of thinking about um, substance use world, um, um, I know that, uh, mm. Paul, that's an interest of yours, that's an interest of mine. Um, that's another way, again, mitigating risk um, uh, and concern for, for, for patient care. Um, why there's an, an, an option of doing um, the long acting is um, the idea of, it, when you open up the capsule of a long acting, there's just literally hundreds of beads. Um, so, so that's much more difficult to um, utilize in, in an inappropriate way. Um, now, um, dovetailing into the dual diagnosis world, um, there are non-stimulant medications that are FDA indicated for um, ADHD, um, and there are four now. So guanfacine, the extended release version, clonidine, the extended release version, atomoxetine, and then uh, a newer one, um, bilozan bilozanthine, um, B B I L O A X Z I N E. Uh, that's the newest one, um, which which actually, when you look at the mechanism of action, um, is very similar to um, bupropion. Um, um, and and, and bupropion itself is actually one of the medications that we would think about as a kind of second or third line um, for for ADHD. Um, so the the non stimulants. Um, the way that you would get to a non stimulant in a traditional fashion in terms of like an algorithm. So you've tried stimulant number one. Um, you've tried to optimize it for whatever reason, person is not comfortable with it. Whether that's starting out in the methylphenidate or starting out in an amphetamine. So you've tried to optimize and perhaps the second stimulant, assuming that you've gotten there, you've tried to optimize in the same class. Yeah, they're just intolerant, headache, um, uh, abdominal pain. Say, so, okay, let's switch classes. So let's go from a methylphenidate to an amphetamine, or if you happen to be on amphetamine, going to methylphenidate. You're trying to optimize. Person still saying, Doc, uh, this, is, this is just not it for me. Now, instead of the headache and the abdominal pain, they're talking about irritability and they just recognize that they're just a little bit more on edge when they take it. So then you say, okay, well, we have these non-stimulant options. And that's where, again, for the non-stimulants, the, the way that I uh, tend to think about it is they're particularly good for inattention, which again, if, at the adult um, uh, uh, patient population, hyperactivity is likely not going to be the, the issue at hand. And so, um, there is really good evidence for um, guanfacine extended release or clonidine extended release. Um, now, the side effects to be notable are, you know, hypotension. Um, so you got to tell people, like, hey, you know, like have a cup of water by, by your side uh, when you're getting up, uh, feet squarely on the ground. Um, so, so those are those are two. And then the atomoxetine. In terms of atomoxetine in adults, um, there's actually a, a, a fair bit of evidence in the adults that have like the neurodevelopmental conditions that started out in, in childhood. Um, and that can be rather helpful, um, whether that's atomoxetine by itself or atomoxetine kind of paired with um, one of the, the, the other classes of stimulants that we mentioned. Um, and even the guanfacine or the clonidine actually can be paired with the, the other stimulants in so much as the person, let's say that their, um, their main issue that they're noting, again, this is adult population, um, palpitation, um, and they suspect that maybe their, their blood pressure is rising, then you have a good re rationale as to, you know, why to pair a guanfacine plus uh, a methylphenidate. Um, the vilozanthine um, is interesting in so much as in its study, 
um, that that kind of prompted it to to be um, uh, FDA indicated. It actually improves concentration, which is very different than the um, adamoxetine, clonidine, or um, guanfacine. So this is actually a non-stimulant, but gives you seemingly stimulant effect. Um, and so um, we were talking about this earlier. Um, had a patient uh, once ago, adult male, who happened to have a cardiac event not related to substances. It actually was just um, genetic history in the family and had a diagnosis of ADHD, had been on stimulants um, you know, from teenage years, um, so had been on methylphenidates, had been, had been on uh, amphetamines, had been on adamoxetine. It was like, you know, his primary care provider said, hey, you can't take stimulants anymore. But he, but he knew he needs to function um, uh, in, his, in his work, in his home. And so uh, this is where um, the, the evidence for uh, biloxanthine is that it happens to be the one non-stimulant that doesn't affect blood pressure. Uh, so there's no cardiac, there were no cardiac events or adverse reactions in, in the study population. So they like, hey, we're going to try this. Um, here's what's to be expected. And um, almost seemingly like the study, within the month period of time, um, he recognized, oh, I can concentrate. He did say it was different than the stimulants in so much as there didn't seem to be an off-on switch. Um, but he recognized, like, as the day progressed, he was able to kind of focus uh, uh, much better. So um, that's that's one that I think um, will prove to, to be beneficial over time. Um, just had to get more and more evidence. Kevin, I want to go back to the, the psychostimulants since it sounds like when given the option, that's going to be our first line medication. Um, I, I'm wondering, before you prescribe, is there is there any laboratory testing or any physical examination screening that you do? Like, should these patients get a TSH? Should they get an EKG before you start? You know, I, I imagine most of the concerns are sort of cardiac and hypertension related. So what what kind of uh, pre-prescribing workup should we, should we consider, if any, before we start these medications? There is inquiring about cardiac history, um, you know, both for the person as well as familially. So it should be blood pressure checked. Um, in terms of other biomarkers, um, it's not inappropriate to do a, a, a general screen of things that, again, could be associated with other mental health conditions. Um, so TSH wouldn't be inappropriate, but it's not definitively um, required that one gets a, a TSH. But you do want to get blood pressure um, pre and then also, you know, as a person is taking it, um, uh, regularly inquire about, okay, hey, um, assuming that this is a virtual meeting, um, asking them when's the last time that they checked their, their blood pressure. If it is in person, def definitively getting it and documenting what that is. Um, so, so that tends to be um, the, the measure that we most want to um, you know, have on, on, on file um, in terms of ensuring that um, there, there isn't anything adverse happening. Um, I mean, the evidence would suggest that the blood pressure rise is is not significant. Um, but again, if someone's already borderline, then yes, you do want to uh, make sure that, that that you get that. The patient we presented you is 23 years old. And part of my question, because I, I have a bunch of patients have been on these medications for 10, 20, maybe 30 years in some cases. What's the end game? I mean, do they, is, this is a chronic condition. Do they, do people tend to grow out of it when they get to their 60s, 70s, 80s? Do we we stop these medications and, uh, or do, taper them off? Yeah, no, so, so this is a good question. Um, I generally describe it as, or, or, suggest if you find it beneficial, right, whether that's for work or otherwise, because again, ADHD in theory should not turn off, then perhaps there are Saturdays and Sundays that you would take it because you still have things to do. Um, now, if you want to quote unquote take a medication holiday, as some might call it, because, you know, um, the holiday season is arriving and you're going to be off of work, um, you're, you're on vacation, um, it is okay to not take the medication. Again, presuming that the things that require executive functioning, I guess, have 
been planned already and there isn't a demand on you to um, need to be as alert as you would be. Um, so that's just to say that people can, again, not necessarily take it on a Saturday or Sunday or if there's a planned trip um, vacation, um, they don't have to, to take it. Um, in terms of some of the other evidence, so this is in line with the idea of like, do I take it or not take it? So um, there is good evidence about, again, executive functioning, attention, and driving. Um, so persons who end up in motor vehicle accidents because they were not on their medication. Um, so sometimes just by virtue of the severity of the condition, it is, yes, you should take this every day. And if you get, again, to an optimized mm -hmm. dose, um, it should be okay that you're consistently taking it as long as we're tracking that um, uh, blood pressure. Um, much the same way, um, you, you know, it, the kind of inquiry would be if someone were to have um, diabetes and they need to be on, um, you know, insulin, we're not really saying, well, how long do we have to do? You have to do it on, as long as the person has the condition. Um, and we know that if there wasn't effective treatment, um, you know, they'd be suffering from um, what, whatever the condition is. So in this case, ADHD. Sure. Um, as people do get older, so thinking about the times that um, I have engaged with um, geriatric patients, you know, again, what is or isn't the like cognitive demand on them um, might indicate whether or not um, to continue a stimulant or not continue a stimulant. Um, and and this is kind of getting into in, in, into some nuance, right? Sometimes you actually might initiate a stimulant uh, for the sake of um, trying to stimulate um, some cognitive activity um, in in certain types of geriatric patients, right? So um, overall, there, there's no guidance on it. It's only for five years, or it's only for ten years. Um, it, mm -hmm. it is for the duration of the time that that uh, patient has benefit to. It. One, one thing I want to ask about, I mean, many things I like to ask about, I, I think I could do this for the next seven hours, but I guess <laughs> one thing that it's probably important to sort of bring up now is, you know, I think we, we were talking before we started, I think in my training, someone had to have, I don't know, a, a stone tablets that were inscribed by God saying that they were previously on, um, you know, methylphenidate or they needed, you know, it's something like an act of Congress or something for us to sort of continue the medication because there was just such concern for diversion. So I guess my, my question is my long winded wind up for this is, how are you using uh, urine toxicology, if at all, to sort of guide management? Like, is that something that you're using to, to track adherence to treatment and sort of concerns about comorbid substance use? And then secondly, what other sort of steps can we take? Well, I guess, how worried should we be about diversion and what can we do to kind of mitigate? The evidence here would suggest um, not to do, you know, random spot urine testing um, unless, again, if a person's in a substance use program, and um, again, the um, role and rationale as to the, the use of the urine test is explained to the patient as to the why, um, then yes, it could be utilized. So for instance, um, within the, the program clinic that, that we run, yes, there are some patients that do um, agree to urine testing. Um, and oftentimes what we're looking for is actually not the um, um, uh, breakdown products of the methylphenidate or the amphetamine. We will see that it's there, but that, that, that is not why we utilize urine testing. Now, if there's a uh, medication that we want the patient to be taking um, because they have another condition, what we want to see breakdown product of uh, naltrexone, for instance, or we want to see the breakdown product of the buprenorphine, right? So, so for those conditions, that is the rationale um, for the urine testing. Right. Um, and then oftentimes, um, you know, I, I know sometimes um, the, the the frame harm reduction tends to like sometimes be misconstrued, but you can actually use urine testing in a harm reductionist kind of way. It's in so much, I've had patients who only thought they were doing one thing. And yep. because they're getting the urine testing and we've explained, I'm not using this to tell a probation officer or to get to, I'm literally using this for objective data to know physiologically what is inside you. And I've had patients who um, have indicated that, oh, I, 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 yes, intended to 
uh, engage in use of cocaine. And I say, well, I'm going to show you there's literally no cocaine here. Oh, but there's <laughs> right. fentanyl that showed up. But fortunately, you have yeah. been taking um, buprenorphine or you have been taking naltrexone, right? And so, and they will say, I knew it wasn't it because I didn't get the feeling that I thought I was going to get. Or there's someone who, uh, again, intentionally uh, wants to engage in um, cannabis or marijuana and something else shows up, right? So in the Northeast, particularly in Massachusetts, I, I believe the data would suggest now, if it's a street substance, more than 70% chance it's adulterated with something else. Um, and so yep. that's where the yeah. use of the urine uh, toxicology is important. Um, not so much if someone, you know, just has ADHD and um, were, it, it, that, that's not, that's not why we're, we're, we're using it. Great. And in terms of the, the diversion question, like, I guess, how, how concerned should we be? I mean, you mentioned using the PDMP just to sort of confirm past prescribing history. Is there anything else that we should be thoughtful about? Yeah. So, so the PDMP um, is critically useful right now. I think the other thing to um, be cautious of, right? So um, if it's the first time that you're prescribing it, and if your clinic has the space to do this, right, perhaps you, you don't need to necessarily prescribe the full 30-day dose, um, and, and you initiate a 14-day, and you see how that has gone for a person. Um, but in terms of the, um, the diversion, um, again, it is very less likely that people will be diverting the, the, the long-acting, because, um, again, the, the the way in which the capsules inside work, uh, they don't work immediately. So, so um, if you've now established, um, you know, good patient-physician relationship, trust, um, and you hear about somebody who has benefit from the, the morning dose, um, and, you know, a, a, a lot of patients do have to, uh, you know, work doubles or have two shifts, um, this is where, you know, considerations of um, a quote-unquote booster um, dose comes into play. Um, and the booster can be a short acting, um, but, but often here I will be very nuanced and say, okay, how often are you doing the double? Because I, I, hmm. I hope you're not doing the double every day. Um, and so I might then <laughs> right. tailor how many boosters I give to indicate that, yes, when you do the double, you can take the booster. Um, and so that's where, again, in, in a specialty clinic, um, I'm not just automatically saying, oh, you get a booster every day. So it's 30 for the booster and 30 for the long acting. It might be 30 for the long acting. It might be 15 for the booster. Um, because again, the, if you're not doing that on the weekends, generally you probably don't need that. Um, so, so this is where I get really detailed into um, kind of the workflow of the person. And when I say workflow, meaning just general, generally what mm. they need to be doing. Is the booster dose that you discussed also, let, let's say they're on list dexamphetamine, which is a long acting formulation, and they took it in the morning, would the booster dose be the same formulation, like a, a, also a long acting and they would just take it later in the day. So again, this is a, a nuance here. So classically, it's long acting and then a short acting. Because the thought is that the long acting um, bridges the person or covers the person. Uh, you know, I'm just going to say eight o'clock for, for for sake eight. Yeah. To two, and the person recognizes, yeah, two doc. Oh, I I really got to like put a lot of effort into trying to pay attention. And so then this is where you might say, okay, well, let's take the booster, but not at two, take the booster at one, because we just know the onset's going to, you know, so as the mm -hmm. long acting is finishing, you start to, you take the booster at, at one. And I know that an hour later, that's going to start to have its effect. And the short acting is classically three to five hours, depending on, on, on the, the, the medication. Okay. So it's not messing their sleep up and yes, it's not messing their sleep up. Um, but it is helping them in the case that they, you know, have a report that they need to just get in. Um, they want to study. Um, again, they, they, there's some other activity that they need to do where, where they really do need to be on. Um, right. so, so that's where you can put 
long acting than short acting. There, there is a subset of patients, but again, this is not the majority, that might take two long actings in so much as the long acting does not impact, like negatively impact your sleep. Um, and okay. So, so there are some patients that, that I have um, that, 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 that is, you know, um, what their physiology is. Also, uh, in terms of certain types of substance use conditions, right, when we're thinking about um, patients that might have had a methamphetamine use disorder, um, uh, other types of stimulant use disorders, um, it actually can be um, efficacious to prescribe the stimulant in so much as it's preventing them from seeking it uh, vis-a-vis the street where there's other harms. Um, and you might have to prescribe rather high doses just in so much as the street versions of some of these substances uh, supersedes uh, you know, physiologic demand. Um, so sure. so you, you, you might be at the, the upper end, um, but for the, for the fact that the person's coming to the clinic um, and being engaged in care, right, there still are other aspects of care that you can be helping them with um, so it's not to say that somebody that has, again, a stimulant use disorder, a cocaine use disorder, methamphetamine use disorder cannot be prescribed a stimulant. Um, but again, this, this, I would say, should be within the purview of someone. That's what they do. They, 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 they treat dual diagnosis. They treat substance use disorder. They have a team um, because, you know, this would not, that uh, patient uh, clientele profile would not be appropriate just for a doc who does not have other clinical ancillary supports that are also checking in with the patient. Because if you're part of a substance use program, right, in a, in a clinic, well, classically, there's a, there's a nurse who's checking on medications, clinical social worker, maybe a team mm-hmm. of clinical social workers who's engaging the person in individual therapy, motivational interview. Um, in addition to then, yes, the prescribing that might happen from a pharmacologic standpoint. Um, but, but, so again, it's not to say that's impossible, but that's that's not necessarily the patient profile for the, oh, I prescribe and then I'm just going to see you in two months. It, it, it's likely somebody that you're engaged oh, yeah. with them and, and they're, they're part of your clinic, again, getting other services somewhat regularly. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think if I was, gosh, if I had a patient with a history of simulant use disorder and and had concern for ADHD, that's someone probably where I would sort of, that would be well outside of my comfort range, I think. I think I would probably seek a little bit more specialized care. But I guess if there was someone, say, who has opioid use disorder uh, and has been stable for years, and I feel like this actually comes up a fair amount mm-hmm. and then sort of shares that they have a, a prior history of, of ADHD and they were on medications before, I guess, can you sort of talk me through your approach to that? Is that is it an absolute no-go to do psychosimulants? And would you start with some of the non-simulant stuff or is it a case-by-case basis? Or what's your overall approach for someone with, like, say, opioid use? There, there's no um, hard line of, oh, you have an opioid use disorder, severe opioid use disorder, uh, moderate opioid use disorder that, that um, I would feel compelled not to uh, prescribe the stimulant. But again, have we made sure that the opioid use disorder is managed as best as possible that, as it can be? Um, and so, so what I say is there's no hard, fast rule that says no. Um, and, and just in terms of any kind of the principle that, that we have is anytime that there's um, evidence-informed care, um, evidence-informed uh, prescribing practices that keeps the person engaged in care, right? Like that is what you should be doing. I feel like in my, in my limited experience, it's, it's funny, the ADHD declares itself once they're sort of stable from their opioid use standpoint. So once they're in a position where they're actually attending their job, that's actually where, like, actually I'm having a hard time focusing on the work that I'm now able to do because my opioid use disorder is well managed. Yes. Like, I think that's yes. the circumstance that I see sort of time and time again. It's challenging, and and I and I greatly appreciate um, the the primary care docs that, that do take this on because you, you all prescribe more psychotropics than, than, than psychiatrists do. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I know the, the amount of patients that you're seeing, the kind of time crunch. Um, so, so I'm appreciative to, to be of any kind of help and service um, in, in, in educating. Um, it, it, again, my wife's a hospitalist. She poses these questions. I consult her all the time. Um, so <laughs> it, this, this comes up um, and, and hopefully this has been helpful. It's been great. Matt, do you think we should uh, move to take home points? Yeah, Absolutely. 
All right, Kevin, anything that you or you think our audience should absolutely have taken away from this? What are like the, the key things you'd like our, our folks to take home? Key points to take home when thinking about ADHD in terms of um, yeah, medications, stimulants, methylphenidate derivatives, and amphetamine derivatives, you should probably be very comfortable to know um, what's on formulary within you know your state's insurance plans. Um, long acting as first line between long acting and short acting, so long acting. Um, the non-stimulants, the uh, guanfacine, clonidine, adamoxetine, and vilozanthine, uh, the first three are actually rather helpful for inattention, uh, but don't particularly help with focus. Uh, the non-stimulant that can help with focus, at least for the study, is the um, vilozanthine. Um, in terms of um, mitigating risk. So this is why you have the PDMP. This is why you can't put initially on the e-prescription refill one, two, three. Um, the person's going to have to come back. Um, and if a provider is in the space of um, substance use disorder, uh, this is where I think, you know, a, a referral to an appropriate clinic would be uh, appropriate because there are nuances as to um, when to provide first line agent versus when uh, to provide a, a different um, line agent. Um, so, so those would be some of the take home points that I think the audience should come away with. Um, this is it's challenging, but but I think when we do it well, patients really do benefit. And we will be back with our lightning round. We'd love to hear a hobby or interest you have outside of medicine. Um, to at, at least as our first question, I'm sure Paul is going to have some other questions for you too. Yeah. So one, thanks for having me on. Um, in terms of hobby or interest, I am somewhat of a burger connoisseur, um, and I any state or city I go to, I do kind of look up top ten burgers and try to get um, a really good burger. My wife won't like that, but th this seems like a really <laughs> worthwhile hobby, Paul. I gotta 100%. say. Uh, I've returned to eating meat again, Paul, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm back, I'm back on the burger train, Paul. So me and Kevin, if I, if I'm ever up in Boston, Kevin, I'd love to grab a burger or at least get your recommendation where to go. Definitely can. Have you, so have you had burgers in Philadelphia? I'm not, not an important question. So if we're helping Matt out, have you, is this a city you've had a chance to rank? <laughs> so yes. Interesting enough. So Philly was my, the, the first place that I actually had five guys and this is probably like a oh, decade ago. Good choice. Um, and I remember eating it. And shortly thereafter, being on the couch, just taking a good nap, taking a good nap. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the ultimate sign of a quality hamburger, really. <laughs> yes, not not knowing uh, a regular was a double um, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, a good nap and a pervasive sense of shame, and you know you've done right. Um, <laughs> I always like to talk about sort of uh, any piece of sort of pop culture or, or actual culture that you've enjoyed recently. So do you have any book, movie, TV show recommendations you'd like to make for our viewers? Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of a book, um, I'll, I'll mention just two. So there's, um, and thanks for the feedback. This is by Douglas Stone and, and Cheryl uh, Heen. Um, and it's a really good book in terms of just understanding how to be receptive um, to feedback as well as giving it, uh, and just giving the audience, um, and I know there's a lot of trainees who listen. Um, I think it's a really good book. And the other is think again by Adam Grant, um, which, you know, it's already hard to learn something new. And then in particularly in our field, how do you unlearn something? Um, and the challenges around that. Um, so that's what, um, think again uh, is about. So those are two books that I recently read that, that were particularly interesting. Excellent. I think this is the second or third time I think Thanks for the Feedback has come back, right? I believe so. Yeah. I, I could probably stand to read both these books, actually. These are these both sound like right up my alley. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like your heart wasn't quite in that one. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. You can also send an email to ask 
curbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And I wanted to give a special thanks to Paul for writing and producing this episode and to our whole team. The technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And Matt, as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye.